Paleo Runner Podcast is devoted to finding better ways to live, run, train, and eat. I'm your host, Aaron Olson. You can find more information by going to paleorunner.org. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a review. Search for Paleo Runner in iTunes and click Ratings and Reviews. You can also follow me on Facebook.com slash RunPaleo or on Twitter at RunPaleo. I wanted to take a minute to let you know about a product I've been using called 3Fuel. 3Fuel is a sports drink that gives you fat, protein, and carbohydrates to use as a fuel source. Unlike sugar sports drinks, 3Fuel gets absorbed slowly into your bloodstream to give you sustained energy throughout your workout. If you'd like to give it a try, you can get 10% off by using the coupon code 3FOLSON. Go to paleorunner.org and click 3Fuel at the top of the page. If you're listening through the podcast app on iPhone, click the link displayed on the app right now. My guest today is Dean Carnassus. Dean is one of the world's most famous ultramarathon runners. Dean has run marathons and ultramarathons all over the world, including marathons in extreme conditions, such as the South Pole, and running and winning the Badwater 135-mile race across Death Valley. Some of his other uh, running achievements have been running 350 miles in 80 hours without sleep, running 50 marathons in 50 states in 50 consecutive days, and running 3,000 miles across the United States in 75 days. He's also written several books about his vent- adventures in ultramarathons. I'm looking forward to talking with Dean about running, diet, and motivation. Dean, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks so much for speaking with me today. Well, thanks for having me run by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Dean, um, you know, for people who might not have read your book, you know, your books are very interesting and very entertaining. Can you give a little bit of a background to the listeners about how you got into ultramarathoning? Well, you know, I like to say my uh, my adventure began with uh, bad tequila. So I used to, to love to run when I was a kid and then pretty much uh, hung up my running shoes uh, for, you know, most of my life. I mean, I stopped running when I was a freshman in high school after cross-country season. Mm-hmm. And then on my 30th birthday, of all things, I was in a bar with my buddies, uh, you know, doing what you do on your 30th birthday. And um, at about 11 o'clock at night, I said to my friends, hey, I'm leaving. And they said, hold it. You know, what do you mean? Let's uh, let's have another shot of tequila. It's, uh, it's your birthday. Uh, it's only 11 o'clock at night. Where are you going? And I said, well... You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna run. <laughs> they said, "What do you mean you're gonna run?" I said, "I'm gonna run uh, 30 miles tonight to to celebrate my 30th birthday." And they said, "You you know you're not a runner, you're drunk." And I said, "Yeah, I am, but I'm still gonna I'm still gonna do it." So I I literally walked out of the bar at 11 o'clock at night and um, stumbled off uh, heading south. And that night, in about seven and a half hours, I ran 30 miles, <laughs> and it forever changed the course of my life. Oh wow, that that's an incredible story. Um, had you always had a passion for running you said you run it ran in high school what what happened in between high school and then your 30th birthday yeah so i you know i actually started running when i was a young a really young boy at five years old i remember running home from kindergarten and i used to love to run and my my mom always used to freak out like god you're you know you're only a little boy and you're running home from school that's amazing and uh you know i ran uh, competitively through uh, junior high school and as a freshman in high school and then uh, just, you know, basically lost interest, got into other things. I mean, I started surfing, uh, started, you know, chasing women, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> went to college, you know, went to graduate school. Then I went to business school and I had this, this cush corporate job, you know, where everything was comfortable and easy, a big, you know, corner suite in, in this office. And I was just bored, senseless. I was restless. Um, there was no challenge, no struggle, it seemed like, in my life. And um, I just remember that running really hurt. It was really difficult to do and I really found it rewarding and uh, it just that it all came to a, a, a head on my 30th birthday and <laughs> I just rekindled that that fire and uh, the passion has been back ever since wow uh, that's awesome well, you know, one of the things that I'd like to talk about today um, is your diet. You know, when I read Ultra Marathon Man, you had these really funny stories in there about doing things like ordering pizza out on the run and uh, and then, you know, eating a lot of kind of maybe not as clean food during your runs. And I, after listening to, I actually listened to 50-50 while I was running and I heard that you, you're now trying to eat more like a caveman. Uh, wh- where did this idea of the caveman diet come in to your running and is that something you're still doing? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think you're, you're right. I'll never live down that story of um, <laughs> being stranded in the middle of the night on a long run and uh, having a credit card and that cell phone and, and ordering a, a pizza delivered to me. Um, mm-hmm. You know, guys particularly love that story. Uh, but, you know, that being said, I, I will also say that people change. And I think that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to profess that I, I've been a, uh, a really healthy eater my whole life. I went through a period where, like you said, I was... I was just eating garbage. I mean, I'd go on these, you know, these 200-mile runs, 
and I'd just try to get as many calories in my stomach as I could. I mean, I remember one time my, my crew kept a log of all the food I ate during a 200-mile run I did, and in 46 hours and 17 minutes, I consumed about 28,000 calories, and, you know, most of it was, like you said, it was very um, dense packaged food. Uh, I've since, you know, evolved and uh, metamorphosized, I like to say, uh, and and changed my diet completely. And basically, I've, you know, I, I kind of um, uh, got more into the Mediterranean diet. I mean, I'm 100% Greek and um, kind of, you know, started looking at some of these. I'd go to these uh, these Greek festivals and there'd be these, these old men, these old Greek men there that, you know, were in their 70s and 80s. And these guys looked incredible. I mean, they were slender, fit, low percent body fat. And they used to... They they used to dance, these Greek dances, you know, for five, six, seven hours at a time without break. And I thought, what are these guys doing? You know, they have such energy. Mm-hmm. And I was watching their diet, and they were basically just Mediterranean diet. They never ate anything out of a bag. And so I started shifting my diet going in that direction and found that it really left me with a, a very sustained level of energy. You know, when I was carbo loading, I'd kind of go through this really pronounced high and then kind of fall off the cliff. And I found as I started, you know, cutting out a lot of these packaged foods and completely cutting out any refined grains. No, no wheat, no oats, no rice, nothing, you know, that's been machine processed. I started to feel just much more vibrant 24-7. I mean, throughout the whole day, I had a really nice level of uh, energy without these these big troughs. And so I just continually, um, uh, you know, deleted foods that brought me down and uh, kind of ended up in, you know, in, in paleo mode, if you will, just, mm-hmm. you know, by, by default, if nothing else. Yeah, mm-hmm. the process of elimination. Yeah. So people... I think, might you know, uh, there's a... There's there, there, I, I, there's a hero of mine. His name's Jack Lalane, which yeah. you're probably too young to remember Jack Lalane. But I mean, he had this great quote. He said, uh, "If man makes it, don't eat it, and if it tastes good, spit it out." <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget that. That's a great quote. You know, some people listening to this might be thinking, so you're eliminating grains, rice, um, you know, a lot of these foods that we're told by magazines that are really healthy for us and are good to eat. Um, what are they supposed to eat instead? What are some things that you eat on a daily basis, to, especially to fuel, you know, in long endurance activity like you're doing? Well, you know, I, I will, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying as far as what these magazines say, and I will, I will say that I read so much mis- information and especially in popular magazines and you, you just I mean you just know that in five to ten years they're all going to be um, you know saying exactly what we're saying right now to eliminate these things we I just discussed so I think mm-hmm. they're just behind the curve, and there a lot of people just follow kind of this this uh, existing wisdom, and it's not wisdom at all. It's kind of wise tales that have just been passed down. And food manufacturers, you know, I hate to say it because I've been in the food industry uh, much of my career, but they really do a, a good job of, um, of of misleading consumers. I mean, saying you know eating breakfast cereal is healthy when when you know you know you look at the the, the spike in your blood sugar when you eat a refined cereal product. Um, um, it's horrible, and you know they they have the nutritionist saying, well, they're whole grains, and <laughs> you know mm-hmm. I say any grain is not whole because you you can't just walk up to a piece of wheat and stick it in your mouth. I mean, it has to be processed, even if it's not um, basically milled and tooled down. It still needs to be processed to be eaten. So it is a refined grain, even if it's a whole grain. Mm-hmm. So I would say that um, you know the popular press is going to is going. It's already you're already starting to see more and more people um, talking about the elimination of some of the things we discussed and going more in this paleo direction and that's just going to continue but mm-hmm. to you know to your question what do you eat well um, you know, I still eat the same number of calories as I was eating before. It's just a different type of, um, of constituency that, that I put in my mouth. I mean, I eat a lot of, you know, uh, wild Pacific salmon. You know, being a West Coast guy living in San Francisco, we get a good supply, so I'm lucky there. But a wild Pacific salmon is a great source of protein. It's chocked with omega-3 fatty acids. And the mercury level um, of wild Pacific salmon is, is very low, so I don't have to worry about um, mercury toxicity as, as with some of the other uh, species of um, pelagianous fish. I also eat, um, uh, you know, a lot of monounsaturated oils. I mean, if you look at the, the oils that I get, most of it's from uh, olive oil or uh, avocados or nuts, so largely uh, monounsaturated oils. Um, a lot of uh, leafy greens and a lot of fruit. I mean, <laughs> a whole lot of fruit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And fruit, as we know, is is chock full of um, 
uh, carbohydrates, uh, fructose and glucose. Right. So um, I, I really rely on uh, whole fruit and cut fruit um, for much of my carbohydrate um, intake. Uh, now, you know, that being said, I, I, I do like protein in my diet. And I also do eat um, Greek-style yogurt. So mm-hmm. it's just uh, yogurt that's no sh- – it's unadulterated yogurt. There's no sugar at it. There's you know, it's it's full fat, 100% fat. It's, it's not. It's just. It's though so it came out of a out of a, a goat or a cow and and fermented. So it's um it's there's there's nothing been added to it. I, I like protein in my diet. I find that protein actually helps me recover quicker. Um, there's a guy that I train with who's an incredible athlete, a friend of mine, and he's a fruititarian. Mm. And he literally only eats fruit. And he's not emaciated. He's not anemic. <laughs> he's mm-hmm. been on this diet for years. And at first, I, I didn't believe him. I thought, okay, I'm going to go through his cupboards. You know, he's going to have some beef jerky in there or something. <laughs> uh, but he only eats fruit. So I, I think there's a wide gamut of misunderstanding um, in the scientific community and in the, the lay community about, you know, what what you can live on and, you know, because, be, you know, traditional wisdom is that we need protein, right? And he's, yeah. he's eating a, a diet that's basically 80-10-10, so it's 80% of his uh, calories are carbs, 10% is uh, fat, and 10% is protein. It's not even complete protein, mm-hmm. but he's somehow um, in very good shape. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned that, you know, Sometimes we get caught up in saying one way is, is the best way for everyone, but there's a lot of different diets that uh, work better for different people, and I, I think that's important to look at too. Yeah, I think that you need to kind of find your own, and I think that you know my guidance to, to anyone listening to this is uh, listen to everyone, follow no one. <laughs> we're all you know we're all a kind of an experiment of one, especially when it comes to. Uh, uh, athletes and diet. So um, try to you know experiment a lot in your training to find what works for you. Really tune into your body and tune into foods that you eat and how they impact both your performance and your mood. And and try to um, alter things uh, you know b- based on uh, on both those two elements. Mm-hmm. You know, one thing I've heard a lot about lately is that uh, some healthy fats probably aren't as bad for you as people used to think. And that fueling your body with healthy fats can actually help you during your runs because you. you you have this enormous reserve, even on a lean person, of fats in the body. And if you can teach your body to sort of utilize those fats, you won't need to take in as many of the goos and the Gatorades and the, and the gels and stuff like that. Have you found that you've had to use less of those products have you, as you've gone to this diet that you're on now? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, the, what you're saying is, is so relevant. And, you know, things like, um, uh, you know, coconut oil, which we, you know, traditionally shy it away from, right? It's not good for even palm oil. Uh, we're finding that those things are not so bad after all and that, uh, you know, fat has, as you stated, fat triglycerides have uh, nine calories per gram where uh, carbohydrate only has four calories per gram. So um, fat is a much more concentrated source of energy. There's almost twice as much energy in, in the same amount of fat as there is in carbs. Actually, there's more than twice twice as much energy in the same amount of fat. So um uh, you know, w- one of the the things that scientists have been looking at over over many years is how is it that women uh, compete head to head with men in these these super long distance endurance events? Uh, even the, you know, especially these these open o- open ocean swimming events mm. and you know long distance cycling triathlons. Women are right up there with men. And you know, at first they thought, okay, well, you know, the women have a high le- higher level of estrogen because of child rearing, so they're uh, less immune to pain because estrogen apparently um, numb some of the pain sensations. And then the other thing they looked at is, well, women have a higher percentage of body fat, so they're more efficient at utilizing body fat as an energy source. So like you said, they're tapping into this much greater reserve um, since you only store a couple thousand calories of, uh, of, of glycogen or you know, a carbohydrate in your muscles. And once that runs out, you tap into fat, and women are much more efficient at using fat. So a lot of athletes now, marathoners and especially ultra marathoners, are shifting to a higher fat diet and learning to to work out while metabolizing fat. The thing is, the intensity level, um, you know, you have to bleed below your aerobic threshold or otherwise, you know, if you're sprinting and then um, oxygen deprivation, <clears throat> uh, you're using carbohydrate. But most of these events, you're not quite, you know, above 80% of your target heart rate. You're below that level, so you are metabolizing principally fat. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, yeah, I mean, I just did a 50-miler on uh, this last weekend, and, you know, I was, 
it was funny when I was fueling, I was coming into these aid stations, and um, you know they had all the typical foods out, the bars and the gels and the goos and everything, and I was just saying, give me a spoon and give me that that, that container of peanut butter. They had <laughs> peanut butter and they had almond butter, which you know to me almond butter is even a better fuel source. So I was just spooning in, um, you know, <laughs> mouthfuls of of almond, just raw almond butter, and they're looking at me like you're crazy. And I'm, I said, no, it's a great source of of, uh, of sustainable fat, and yeah. that's what got me through a 50 miler very easily. Oh, awesome! That's great. So how is this? A lot of people, I've been doing sort of this paleo slash caveman diet for about a, just about a year now, and a lot of people say, well, you know, once you have kids, that's going to all go out the door. You you get your kids are going to want to eat snacks and stuff like that. And you have a family. How has it been um, doing this sort of whole foods um, caveman diet with your family? <laughs> <laughs> it's been uh it's been interesting. Um you know, it's funny my my wife kind of bought into it and shifted her diet and she was amazed because she's she's not an athlete mm-hmm. and she changed absolutely nothing in her life except her diet. So she and she did not alter the number of calories she was taking in. She just took in different forms of calories, basically shifting to this this paleo type diet. And she naturally uh, lost um, about 10 pounds. And she was never big to begin with, but she lost about 10 pounds. And most of it was body fat. So her lean muscle tissue as a percentage of her overall body weight increased. And she lost body fat just only by the food she was putting in her mouth. So she was she's pretty convinced it works. Um, my 14-year-old son, yeah, he went to a paleo as well, mm-hmm. and uh, he 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 believes in it. You know, even though he's 14, he believes in it, and he goes on and off. I mean, he'll be on a paleo diet for three months, and he'll say, ah, "I'm going to go have some pizza with my friends," mm-hmm. and I'll go have pizza. You know, he might have a burger, and you know, he takes off half the you know the top bun, keeps the bottom bun on. <laughs> Um, and then he goes completely paleo at points. So he's he's bought into it as well. Um, my daughter thinks we're nuts. <laughs> she, she's going to stick with her breakfast cereal and uh, her toast, which she just loves. So uh, she, she she's still not. Uh, she might be convinced it works, but she just doesn't have the discipline to get there. Okay. But I, you know, having I don't think having a family has to change anything. Mm-hmm. Nor does travel. I mean, people say, oh, I travel so much, I'm eating junk food. <laughs> the two are not correlated. Mm-hmm. I travel all the time, and I don't eat junk food. I mean, you just have to uh, you have to have discipline in uh, in making your food choices, and even you know restaurants. I mean, I go to restaurants, and most of the chefs there now are used to people saying, "Hey, you know, can you can you not? I, I don't want the rice peel off. You know, just give me some extra steamed broccoli. Um, you know, I I won't eat you know the the potato." <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know they're they're used to um, altering their dishes for people that are paleo, which is great. And I think it's just going to increase over time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, do you have any tips for people? As you said it's it's not that hard to do while you're traveling. Do you bring along your own food, or do you just ask, uh, like you said, for the for the broccoli instead of the rice? You know, I do a combination of both. I mean, when when I travel, I carry a lot of fruit with me, mm-hmm. and you know, I've, I've got to say that most airports now, the, the choices have changed a lot. I've become a lot healthier. So. You know, between carrying, um, you know, some fruit in your backpack with some some almonds, um, mm-hmm. you know, you're you're pretty set. Even some beef jerky. There's a product uh, that's called Crave. I don't know if you heard of Crave beef jerky, but it is cha- It's just revolutionized jerky in my mind. It's the most tender. Um, organic premium uh, beef jerky around and you know you put a package of that with some almonds and you know a banana and some apples in in your backpack and you're pretty set Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know another thing I'd like to uh, ask you about is footwear I know you work with the North Face and a lot of people in the paleo or primal movement have kind of been getting into more minimalist footwear is that something that you've tried out you know, I've been a big proponent of uh, minimalist footwear uh, forever. I mean, I remember when I was a kid in high school, um, our coach used to have us uh, run uh, from our from our high school track to the beach. We, I, I grew up in Southern California, which is kind of nice. I was down there in uh, South Orange County. So we'd run from our track to the beach. He'd have us uh, stash our shoes in the bushes and then run barefoot along the sand, both the soft sand and the hard pack sand down by the water's edge. So we'd run barefoot for miles, and then we'd come back, uh, put our shoes on, run back to the track, and then he'd have us do, um, you know, uh, some uh, cool downs um, on the infield of the track on the grass with no shoes on. So I've always uh, really uh, thought that running barefoot was very advantageous in a lot of ways. 
Now, do I advocate running, you know, barefoot on uh, hard surfaces? No, I don't. I mean, you know, uh, I see periodically people running barefoot on road marathons, mm-hmm. and I, I just don't think the human body was engineered to run barefoot on uh, on pavement. But um, as far as minimalist footwear, again, you know, it's the old adage I, I said before: listen to everyone, follow no one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know people that have or just have had their whole running transformed in a good way uh, because they've gone to minimalist footwear and then I know other people <laughs> that say oh I can't even you know I've wrecked myself because I went to minimalist footwear so mm-hmm. I think you need to find what works for you but I think you know there's so many good choices out there right now I think that um, footwear companies have definitely stepped up and and uh, seen that minimalist footwear you know we, we kind of went overboard right we went too far with the maybe with the five fingers um, with just no protection whatsoever and now they've kind of come full circle and said well let's still have this you know, zero drop sort of shoe that has a little bit of cushioning and a little bit of support. Mm-hmm. So I think, and, and there's everything in between, right? So, uh, yeah, and then there's the hookahs, which are <laughs> like running on pillows, which, you know, there's, I mean, I ran with a guy in his 50 miler and said, yeah, I was, I was in Vibram five fingers last year at this very same race, and now I'm in a pair of uh, hookah trail shoes, <laughs> and I like these better. <laughs> so, I, you know, just find what works for you. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about training. Uh, now that it's summer and it's starting to get, get, you know, hot and you've done marathons in really extreme conditions, what are some of the tips for people that they can do in uh, hot weather? I know I went for about a 12-mile run this morning and I was just running like almost a minute slower than I usually do because it was so hot and humid. What do, what do you have tips for people running this summer? Well, I think, you know, first and foremost is, um, you know, your diet. Um, if you're on the paleo diet, um, you know, you're going to lose body fat. So body fat is insulation, right? Mm-hmm. And my, you know, my wife and I used to have a constant war at our house because <laughs> my body fat is so low that I'd be walking around in, you know, my North Face puffy jackets and you know, with the heater on, and she'd be in shorts, you know, sweating, saying, "God, it's so hot in here," and I would be saying, "It's freezing in here." <laughs> and now that she changed to this paleo diet, um, she's lost a lot of body fat. And she said, "You know, I, I just find that in the summertime, I get a." I don't heat up the way I used to heat up. I mean, I can, you know, I don't need to crank up the air conditioner when I get into the car. I can walk down the street on a hot day and I'm not sweating. So one, I think changing your diet and reducing your body fat will help. Um, you know, a couple other things. Um, one is, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's really, when I do this race called the Badwater Ultra Marathon, which is across Death Valley, they really talk about, you know, two systems you need to keep cool. One is your exterior, so your skin. So try to, uh, you know, if you can, um, you'll carry a, if it's really that hot, carry a plant mister when you're running. Carry a water bottle on one side, one end, the plant mister on the other, and just mist your skin off, hmm. you know, with, with water, because um, then you get that evaporative cooling. And then the other thing is your internal systems, keeping your innards cool. And one way you can do that is just to, to chew on ice mm. and try to swallow uh, as much, you know, whole pieces of ice as possible to get the uh, the coldness in your gut, and that'll help uh, cool your interior. So those okay. are those are two things that uh, I find helpful. Okay, interesting. Um, Dean, do you have any tips for people who might not be ultra marathoners yet, and uh, they might have stumbled across this podcast for getting out there and trying a half marathon or marathon? How do you get started with something like that? I mean, you just jumped right into it, but what have you found? What if, what's your advice for most people out there? Well, you know, I I tell people to start from the ground up. So uh, invest in a good pair of shoes. Uh, go out and go to a specialty running store. Don't go to one of the big box running stores. Go to a specialty running store like a Fleet Feet or you know some of the local running stores and work with a, a knowledgeable staff member to get you into a pair of shoes that really fit you well and fit your running style well. And I think that'll accomplish uh, two things. One, you'll be a lot more comfortable when you start ramping up the mileage. And, and two, if you get lazy and you don't feel like running, you're going to feel real guilty. You spent all this money <laughs> on the <laughs> Expensive pair of shoes are just sitting in your cupboard. So I would say start with a, a good pair of footwear, and, and then you know choose, choose what you like to do. I mean, some people really like the discipline of you know having a set course mm-hmm. and you know watching their GPS and watching their time. They really like that. Other people find that monotonous and tiresome, and they burn out. And for those folks, I say just, you know, find a trail and and go, you know, find uh, a new path every day. I mean, I largely run on a different course every single day I train, Mm -hmm. so I don't get so burned out. Um, Those are some things that help. A lot of people like to listen to music. 
you know, the one thing that I like to listen to, and you mentioned it as well, is uh, listening to audiobooks. Mm-hmm. So I've got about 300 audiobooks now on my playlist. And, um, you know, I, when I ran across America last year, I listened to about 35 books in 75 days of running. So it was, <laughs> you know, it's a great way to get the mileage, um, you know, under your belt. And, some days, you know, you listen to a good book, as you know, and you, you know, you get to the end of your run, and you're like, I'm going to keep going. I just want to get to, the, I want to hear the end of this chapter. So, audiobooks mm-hmm. for me uh, really help, uh, um, you know, the going when the going gets tough, kind of thing. Yeah. Do you have any audiobooks you've been listening to lately that you uh, been enjoying? Let's see. What am I listening to right now? I um, I listened to Inferno, okay. which was a pretty good book. I, I usually don't listen to much fiction. Um, my mom is a, a, an English teacher, and she always told me that fiction is the work of the devil. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, I don't listen to much fiction. Um, I like listening to uh, adventure stories. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of um, The Endurance, which is the story of uh, Ernest Shackleton uh, and trying to get to the South Pole back in uh, the early 1900s. Oh, okay. That's an incredible book. Yeah. There's a book called The Worst Journey in the World. World, which is a, a, a story about um, <clears throat> the adventurer Scott who tried to get to the South Pole, um, you know, into thin air. That was a good one. Into the wild. That was a good one. Mm-hmm. So adventure books to me, adventure stories, um, nonfiction are some of my favorites and autobiographies as well. Oh, yeah. I'll have to check yeah. some of those out that you mentioned. So what do you have coming up next, and, and what's the best way for people to keep up with you? Well, I'm heading out to uh, Death Valley in a couple of weeks to do this little run called the Badwater Ultra Marathon, which is a little 135-mile jaunt uh, across Death Valley in the middle of summer. Awesome. Uh, and that's, you know, that is dubbed the world's toughest foot race. So uh, I'm trying to finish my, uh, my 10th year. Uh, I've, I've done it 10 times so far, the race, and finished nine of those. Mm-hmm. So hopefully I'll go back uh, this year and finish my uh, 10th Badwater Ultra Marathon. And if you want to learn more about my adventures, just go to um, uh, ultramarathon.com, www.ultramarathon.com. Awesome, awesome. And, uh, yeah, and there's there's tips on there as well. There's dietary tips, there's training tips, there's all kinds of information uh, for people that are learning, um, wanting to learn more about how to get into this crazy sport or any sport. You know, I always tell people, you know, you don't have to go run 135 miles <laughs> across Death Valley. I mean, run a 5k if, if need be uh, just be you know be the best you that you can be um, it's really uh, you know when you, when it comes to endurance sports it's it's you versus you I mean you're your own worst enemy so just you know challenge yourself never stop exploring if you've run a 5k you know sign up for a 10k if you've run a 10k try a half marathon and if you've run a half marathon try signing up for a full marathon and if you've run a marathon try an ultra mm-hmm. well Dean it's been great talking with you today thanks so much for taking the time out of your day hey, you're welcome it's been a pleasure uh, chatting with you and um, good luck to uh, to you and all the, the listeners. You've been listening to another episode of Paleo Runner Podcast. For more information, go to paleorunner.org. Thanks for listening.